My name's Paul Bestall. This is Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. This week, we're delighted to welcome Lyle Blackburn back to the show to talk about his last few months and the explosion in two notable cases he has been involved in, Momo the Missouri Monster and the legend of Boggy Creek, or the Folk Monster as it's otherwise known. We cover both cases, his continuing work with Small Town Monsters, and what Lyle is currently working on, a new book covering the mysteries and legends of swamps around North America, as well as one of the new Small Town Monsters films for 2020, The Mothman Legacy. Once again, thank you for all the support for the show from around the world. To see where the show is now reaching is amazing, so don't forget to drop us a nice review on your podcast app to help the show grow and reach more people, or share it on social media. Thank you again for your support. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, as well as subscribing to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. Don't forget, next week is the 50th episode, so drop us a line at mysteriesandmonsters at gmail.com to let us know what your favourite show out the first 50 has been, and we'll give you a shout out next week. Right, time for this week's episode, and welcome back to Lyle Blackburn. This week... I am delighted to welcome back Lyle Blackburn to Mysteries and Monsters. Lyle is a renowned author, investigator, narrator, and also performs vocals and guitar for his band Gulltown. With more TV and podcast appearances than you can shake a chupacabra at, Lyle is one of the most well-known cryptozoologists in the field today. Lyle, delighted to welcome you back. How are we? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure. Well, what a year last year was. Um, Obviously, started it off with the release of your latest book Momo and uh, the Missouri Monster um, which was book ended the end of the year with obviously the wonderful small town monsters film how did it feel for you last year because it, it seemed like you you kind of elevated yourself even higher than you your reputation already preceded you <laughs> well you know that's what we strive for right uh... <laughs> Yeah, it was a good year. I mean, one of those uh, rare instances when the various things that I do kind of converge together uh, by the release of the book on the Missouri monster on that subject and then followed up by a film by the Small Town Monsters uh, film company, which uh, not only highlighted the events of the Missouri monster case, but sort of took it in a interesting and unique direction with the way they did that documentary film so uh you know we called it the year of momo and it was uh something that i've always loved that story since i was a kid so it was cool to kind of uh have a look at that in 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 the modern times and to release those uh exciting products yeah i think it was a it was interesting because i think it's one of those stories as, as we touched on when when you appeared way back on episode two um, that I think unless you were really into uh, cryptozoology and, and strange hominid cases around the States, I don't think Momo was really that well known outside of certain circles, Lyle. So do you think that case has kind of really been pushed forward, what with your book and the film as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's one of those that kind of existed in the legends and lore of Bigfoot and while the creature is not exactly described as the ubiquitous Bigfoot um, 
it was one of those where if you would see like a, a cryptozoology map of the United States uh, there on Missouri, you would always have Momo represented, you know, <laughs> and much the way uh, the Falk monster or the Boggy Creek monster is represented for Arkansas. And, you know, I've covered some of these cases in the past where it's a case that had a, a big surge maybe in the 1970s or something and uh, you know a lot of newspaper coverage, but no one had ever really written a comprehensive book on it. So Mobo is one of those that um, sort of existed in cryptozoology circles. Bigfooters knew of it, um, that sort of thing, but it's never had a uh, you know a look, especially with the documentary films, kind of going back and interviewing witnesses or people who recollect all those events that occurred in the 1970s, and, and look at them in the modern light. Mm. I mean, I, I was really impressed with the film. I mean, I usually am with the small town monsters, but I think because it was the the team had kind of attacked it in a different way to some of the normal ones and kind of had a lot of fun with it. Um, and obviously some of the guys were playing roles in the film, but there was some, some shots that went out because I spoke to Seth just before it came out last year. Um, and I was really, it really made me laugh, Lyle, in a good way because there was a, a real... And I don't don't mean this disrespectfully. There was this wonderful cheesiness about it, and 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 the way that you were kind of bookending the the clips and the witness reports with, with you pretending to be this host of this this wonderful show. Um, I really enjoyed it, and some of the little uh, sort of in jokes he was doing, where you were sort of gazing off into the sunset and things like that. I just thought it was a fabulously funny film with a with a wonderful story at the heart of it as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that approach was different than the other sort of straightforward documentaries Seth has done in the past. And, you know, he kind of threw out the idea to me about embedding that sort of uh, fictional idea that I was hosting a cable access television show and we were looking at a alleged film that had been made in the 70s about Momo. And so I'm I'm looking, I'm thinking, you know, this is this is definitely unique and something different. I said, this is either going to be the best thing we've ever done or the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those things. It's either going to go one or two ways, isn't it? So, but I was down because, you know, you have to kind of become inventive because you can't, even though we're talking about a new creature or a new case, you've got to find different ways to offer up the information and to have fun with it. Um, so, you know, I, I saw exactly what he was wanting to do and, you know, the fact that it's kind of cheesy and all that just plays right into what, you know, the concept of that and especially being 1970s and stuff or an old movie, it, it just kind of had a little bit of the legend of Boggy Creek type feel. And, mm. and so, you know, I was happy the way it came off and especially for, what kind of budgets and things we work with, it looks quite good. And I was proud of, of what we did and people responded well, you know, I think most people liked it uh, overall and now people know more about Momo. Yeah. I think it's been interesting as well because it, it, it seemed to be one of those that crossed over into, into kind of more mainstream horror that I think a lot of people who perhaps weren't aware of, of Momo or Small Town Monsters or yourself, it seemed to really pick up some traction on perhaps sites that it wouldn't normally have been noticed by, I think, Lyle. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, because it wasn't just sort of this straight documentary and it had some elements of a horror movie and all that, yeah, it was, you know, covered by blogs that normally just cover horror movies and things like that, so... I think that's great because to me, these subjects of cryptids and, and things like that, you know, dwell in the realms of horror movies because these are essentially, quote unquote, monsters that people are reporting in real life. So to me, they there's not a very uh, thick line between what is maybe something scary or inspired by a story that's made into a horror film and something that's a documentary where people are saying, look, I was scared to death. I saw this, you know, big hairy creature coming at me or something humanoid flying through the air. So it's great that we got those that outside coverage because I think it exposes small town monsters films to 
a, a wider audience that may not otherwise uh, look into it. Yeah, and like you say, I think it was it was interesting that uh, Seth and the team and yourself decided to go down a certain route because, like you say, it's I think sometimes it's it's difficult to try and do something different when you know the previous work that you've collaborated on and and the rest of their films are outstanding documentaries in you know in their own light and in Seth's clearly and and the rest of the team have clearly tried to mix it up a bit but this was a real departure so I think that was was for me probably not that it was it was getting um you know that, that they needed to do it so it was it was refreshing to see that they were prepared to take a risk because with the greatest respect it's very easy to to just keep on doing the same thing when you've had such good responses to previous work Oh, certainly so. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a little bit of a risk to do something outside your own box that you've created, especially when it's, you know, the reviews and the viewership of these small town monster films is well up and above any any sort of thing of an independent nature. So, yeah, it was, it was certainly a risk. And, and like you say, it, we didn't have to do it that way, but I think we approach each of the subject matter as it needs to be. And with Momo... Uh, unlike some of the others, we didn't quite have as many witnesses as as we normally do because the case is old and a lot of the formative witnesses had passed away or in one case just couldn't talk on camera. So that kind of gave us, you know, uh, you know, Seth kind of re envision a little bit of that just to um, perpetuate the story. In a, in a visual way, whereas we didn't have the witnesses to just, you know, tell you in their own words. So that was one of the reasons, obviously. But, um, you know, it works well, and that way you can try something new and gauge the reaction of the viewership. You know, you can always go back to the, to the regular formula, but it's fun to mix it up. Yeah, very much so. Like I said, I was really taken away with it. I thought it was, uh, it was fantastically done, and it, it, it really made me laugh because it was just – the way it was done and the way it was designed and your performance in the in the film as this central host, I just thought it worked fantastically well. So uh, you must be very proud of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely proud. And, you know, I look, I, you know, I kind of go and film these things or offer up the, some research or, I, you know, suggestions on the script. But otherwise, I don't see it till it's pretty much in its final format, you know, like, hey, here it is. We're going to release it in a few days you know check it out so you know i just kind of hope for the best but i looked at it and thought wow that's pretty good for a for a guy who you know i don't have any training in acting or on camera presentation mm -hmm. you know and normally i've narrated these my my voice has some amount of training from being a musician and so forth but you know just <laughs> just hoping for the best that i look okay on camera and you know i've film my parts in roughly 24 hours you know ne memorizing that whole entire script um so when i see the end product i'm like hey you know that's really good <laughs> <laughs> outstanding so let's just have a quick recap of the case then lyle so for anybody who's unaware of it what is momo so momo is the name given to a creature who was first noted in the early 1970s in the state of Missouri. And Momo, the name itself, comes from the abbreviation of the state Missouri, which is M-O, and then Monster sort of shortening that to M-O, so it comes out Momo, which kind of almost implies some cuddly, fuzzy creature, but when in fact what witnesses were describing was very much a – very frightening and startling, upright, uh, Bigfoot-like creature. And it all started on uh, July 11th, 1972, in which uh, some kids in the small town of Louisiana, Missouri, which is on the far eastern border of uh, the state of Missouri, right along the Mississippi River, they lived in this small rural town and their house backed up to this wooded area called Marsoff Hill. And uh, two two young boys were playing out back when they looked up and saw this hulking, hairy creature standing there looking at them. And they said it was, 
you know, maybe six foot tall. It was uh, covered in dark hair. It was standing upright on two legs. Um, the hair covered its face. Its head was large. They described it as like a pumpkin sized head. And it was holding in its arms what appeared to be a dead dog. And so obviously when you look up and see that in your backyard in the afternoon, it's, it's frightening. And, you yes. you know, these, these boys ran for the house screaming and ran inside. And their older sister, Doris, who was uh, 15 at the time, looked out the window and also saw this thing. Um, it lingered there in the on the edge of the woods for a few minutes and then darted back up Marzoff Hill. So they called – their mother, who promptly called their father, Edgar Harrison, and sent him home to check on the kids. And, you know, they obviously told him the story. And based on their conviction and their emotional reaction, he certainly believed that they had seen something, you know, weird. Hmm. And so that set off sort of a, a quick succession of newspaper articles and people in the town, you know, having sightings themselves of this creature, which they theorized to live up on Mars off Hill because it was wooded and, uh, you know, thick and shadowy. And, and so this had a lot of newspaper coverage, um, right there in, in July of 1972 to the point where it was picked up by the associated press and syndicated to other newspapers and quickly created this whole summer of, uh, monster, fury in which people were, you know, coming to hunt the creature, the police were involved, um, you know, people running all over Mars off hill with guns. It was just one of these really crazy things that you just can't even make up. I mean, it's like, you know, like a horror film come to life. And, and not only were there sightings of this creature, which was obviously like a Bigfoot type thing, but there was um, sightings of strange lights in the sky and even strange crafts and uh, people hearing disembodied voices in the woods. So it actually encompassed other paranormal activity, if you will, um, in the case. So it's one that has sort of been established in the golden age of, of cryptozoology, which was around the 1970s, the highest period of high strangeness. And ever since then, people have kind of been interested in it. Um, and so um, it's one that you know, gained a lot of newspaper coverage and then the subsequent sightings that happened after those Harrison kids saw it just sort of reinforced the fact that maybe something was living up there in the woods of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Is it is it one of those that obviously since since the books come out and, and the film's been released, Lyle, has, has anybody else kind of come forward? Because I know sometimes there is occasions where, um, you know, certain cases come back into into fashion or or people bring them back into the light as it were so has anybody kind of come forward with additional information since since last year or has, has it just kind of carried on ticking along with the original report well in any of these cases it seems like no sooner have i released a book but somebody sees it and say oh you know i saw something <laughs> at that time so yeah just like in every time there's been people who uh, you know, I've seen the announcement of the book or the movie or they've read the book and then will tell me about uh, something that occurred, you know, that something that they experienced, whether it was back in the time or something more recent. So there's been a few of those. And I was on a radio show with a rather infamous uh, DJ here in the States uh, out of Chicago and uh, he had seen something out there and wanted me on the television show. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, I didn't even know about his sighting, you know? And, yeah. uh, so yeah, there's just, uh, a number of those that have kind of reinforced the idea that something weird was going on and perhaps is still going on because people do report Bigfoot type sightings in Missouri even today. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's. I think that's one of the aspects of the case that people, I think, either overlooked or weren't aware of, Lyle, is the fact that there were these additional phenomena that were going on. It wasn't just a monster sighting, like you're saying. I know the film touches on the strange lights in the sky and the disembodied voices in the 
in the woods when people, like you say, these these posses turned up monster hunting, which is one of those remarkable things that seems to occur in a few American cases, because obviously the same thing happened when the Mothman flap literally uh, excuse the pun on words began um, that uh, you know everybody started turning up at the TNT area you know locked and loaded and ready to hunt it down yeah yeah it's just it's crazy how that stuff happened especially back then I mean in the Momo case the uh, the chief of police was getting all these reports and of course at first he's like oh yeah okay whatever you know maybe people are drinking too much or they saw a bear but the more that came in and from credible citizens the more he thought well something's going on here you know and they they did organize a posse of 20 men and went up there and combed Mar- mars off hill a couple of times you know in a serious effort to find out what could be up there and not to mention the out of town you know, would be monster hunters that came in as a result of the newspaper coverage. And, and it's just <laughs> running around on the hill <laughs> in the movie. What was cool is we got a couple of cameos by Cliff Berrickman and uh, Bobo who were on the show finding Bigfoot. And so they're in the movie playing roles uh, of these uh, uh, police guys up on the hill, which, you know, just adds a little fun to the whole thing, but it really did happen. And it's, there's so many of those, like you say, with Mothman and, you know, Boggy Creek monster and lizard man, there was so many of these cases that people plunged into the woods with guns that in some of my books, I'm almost like saying, okay, well, and here's the ubiquitous monster hunt, you know, in which they always search, but really never find any say anything, but it's amazing how much of that went on back then. Yeah, it just seems like yeah, it, it was as though people were just basically just twiddling their thumbs waiting for the next the next <laughs> monster to turn up. We're like, right, everybody in the car, let's go. <laughs> a- absolutely. I mean, it was just it, again, you can't make this stuff up. And there there is a there was a situation in, in the Momo uh, flap in which about. Three or four days after the Harrison kids saw that in the backyard, uh, they were having a prayer meeting there at their home. They were they were religious and had this like Wednesday night prayer meeting every week. And there was, you know, a dozen people uh, standing outside the home after uh, the meeting and they saw these lights streak across the sky. And then they hear this loud sort of metallic clanging noise which turned into this big rumbling growl and it it was so scary that miss harrison ran out of the house and and wanted uh, her husband edgar to get him out of there she's like i've had it you know first there's a monster and now there's these noises and lights and she she they jump in the car and by the time they start heading down the street there was this mob of people heading up towards mars off hill sort of like the villagers with pitchforks. I mean, and and she just leaned out the window and said something to the effect of it's coming or they're coming or something, and all these people just scattered. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much out of a movie, but it really happened. You know? uh, I, I think the only disappointment I can think, and, and, and I think Seth kind of touches on this in the film, and, and you certainly do in the book, is that, Unlike some of the places that have essentially embraced their monstrous past and their their weird and wonderful uh, incidents over the, over history, it, it seems as if this town has basically buried it in the 70s and, and until yourself and, and the film came out, not a lot of people really either even even knew about this case, even even if they lived in the town. Yeah, yeah, well, it was a shame to find that because, you know, I go up there to do some research and when I first started working on the book and, you know, I, I'm hoping to see, you know, statues of the monster and stuff, but there wasn't anything. And I went into the library, which you would assume, you know, would be celebrating local culture, even if it was something like this, but they, you know, and I announced who I was and tried to give them my credentials and they didn't seem very impressed. And <laughs> told them i'm gonna write a book on momo and they just you could tell it was sort of like why you know and (laughs) you know and my you know just proceeded to get them to show me the newspaper articles and stuff on file but 
But th- I think they're really missing the boat here because the town, it, it's not like the town. I mean, it's a great little town and it's a little river town and it mm-hmm. certainly has many aspects of Americana to celebrate. But hey, you know, this, this tale is, is the most famous thing out of there, I think. And they should actually absolutely kind of consider, you know, having a, mo- a Momo festival or a Momo days and, you know, having some fun with it because it really does bring people into the town. I mean, I look at the Mothman Festival, you know, 12,000 people showing up now in its, you know, uh, yearly event. So, hey, you know, why not? Absolutely. And I think uh, with the greatest respect, you know, these these towns in in the modern era are are probably struggling to survive or or raise their heads to, to try and even encourage anybody to come and visit them anyway, Lyle. So, Surely it, 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 it's of a of a benefit for everybody in the town that they perhaps try to embrace it a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think so. And I mean, I think it's just the nature of, you know, they kind of think it's silly or, you know, and a lot of people think it was a hoax. And like any of these cases, you always have several people claim that it was them that masterminded it and what have you. But, you know, to me, that, that doesn't matter. It's still it's the story and the fact that it was you know, gain so much press and people remember it today, it makes it part of, you know, the local culture, whether it whether you take it serious or not. And so I, I don't think they, you know, want to play up the monster. And they I'm sure they certainly don't mm. understand that other places have festivals and draw people. So, you know, they maybe someday or maybe next time I go to visit, or something i can talk to the right people that may want to organize something like that yeah absolutely because i I mean like you like we touched on there in regards to mothman i think um outside of you know if you love the weird uh and you live outside of america point pleasant anybody who's into weird phenomena everybody knows point pleasant in west virginia whether they've been to the states or not everybody recognizes that name now um, and I, I'm I'm a little bit sad when I see, like you say, these these towns who aren't embracing, because re- like you say, regardless whether it's true or not, it's modern folklore, um, and it's and it's something very different to to probably towns in the area. It gives them gives them the edge. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it puts them on the maps so much so that yeah, I mean, someone from the UK who may not know anything about West Virginia if they're interested in the paranormal suddenly they're looking at a map figuring out where Point Pleasant is and it you know hey that's that's something that you know is an attraction and perhaps they may visit the states and be within driving distance and say hey why not go check out this area so you never know what kind of tourist attraction it may have so you might as well embrace it and you know, I mean, for me, it's like my geography knowledge has increased, <laughs> you know, a hundredfold just because when I investigate these cases, I start looking at some town I've never heard of and I'm looking at the map and I'm trying to figure out where it is, who lives there, what kind of, you know, ge- uh, uh, what kind of environment or terrain it is. So I learn a lot of geography from cryptozoology. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the uh, the the um the secret benefits of being into cryptozoology lyle is that all of a sudden you said especially for somebody like me who doesn't have a vast experience of of mid-america it's wonderful to be taken on these trips around uh certain states and certain towns because without that i'd I'd probably have no idea outside of the coasts you know other than major cities or my my knowledge of nfl teams uh, (laughs) where they play outside of the coast i think it's i think it's wonderful because it some of the places in, in in these areas are just so wonderfully beautiful and the, the landscape around them is phenomenal. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and on in the converse, you know, I mean, studying things like lit, this, such as, you know, the Beast of Exmoor yes. uh, from the UK, it's like I may have never heard of the fields of Exmoor uh, had I not, you know, started reading up on sightings of, of the – mysterious cat-like creature so you know now my knowledge of a faraway place and if i'm ever remotely near uh, devon or somerset or what have you i'm gonna go there you know because 
to me that's it's great cool you know a uh, uh, a regional spot that I want to visit and the reason I know of it is because there was supposedly a a mystery monster you know absolutely well if Gulltown ever get a gig in Cornwall we'll know why <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> I suppose that's one of the benefits of, of, of being in a band as well sometimes, Lyle, as, as, as we touched on last time when we were we were talking about your love of Boggy Creek, because I know that was something that you enjoyed watching on the tour bus over the years. And uh, I mean, that's obviously something else in the last 12 months that has, has seen a massive resurgence. Obviously, I know you've you've done two books on, on Boggy Creek, but obviously with with Pamela getting the ownership of the uh, her father's film again, that's back in, in the news because obviously she's you know, basically pulled down all the pirates that were, were had it on YouTube and things like that and essentially had it remastered and re-released and you've been working on that as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I've been working with Pam on that and, uh, you know, Pam being the daughter of Charles Pierce who directed the original Legend of Boggy Creek movie from 1972, um, this whole idea and project to find it and restore it and everything has been something that you know she has the power to kind of forefront but I've certainly as as the boggy creek guy if you will I've uh, been involved and helped her and certainly by getting what that film really deserves and getting a new version out there and we've been doing screenings here in the states and it's the uh, blu-ray release is imminent now that's been a yeah big surge for the boggy creek thing and you know just kind of it it just never quite goes away it's just one one thing after another will keep that story alive which certainly helps interest in my books and the subject so um yeah that's another thing it kind of came in the mid of the year of momo also it was kind of yet another year of boggy creek Mm, absolutely and it's as we said when we spoke uh last year you know, Boggy Creek's a film I've been aware of for, for so long. As I, as I said, incredibly, it was shown on national telly here in the UK at six o'clock at night with no warning of its content. And when you're, you know, when you're an eight year old who loves monsters, you sit down and you think, oh, brilliant. It absolutely terrified me. I still have nightmares, uh, nightmares about that, that chap in the toilet who was <laughs> an unfortunate um <laughs> incident shall we say he's probably sat in the right place for something like that to come but uh, and, and you know and that that's the best part of 40 years ago Lyle so it's, it's it's a film that's always been close to my heart here in the UK so it just shows you the power of these films that if it drops on at the right time in the right place people will take that with you for the rest of their lives yeah absolutely and then you know because that film was so much out there and even had international distribution that you know, it had the potential to affect all of us who love that kind of subject matter if it hit us at the right time. And, you know, it surely did, uh, you know, build up so many fans. And even even those that saw it originally have loved it so much that they showed it, you know, to their, uh, you know, children who would then show it to their children. And in fact, we just did a screening of that of the movie, the restored version in Dallas this weekend and there was a family there who had three generations of fans. The father had actually seen the, the movie in, in that theater. I think when it came out back in, in the circulation of 1973, he saw it and then his daughter was, you know, loved it too. And then she, her, her son was there. So I'm looking at three generations of people who had been affected and loved that film I was like, wow, this is just amazing, you know, just uh, the effect it had on people like that. Yeah, I mean, it is it is interesting how it's and it and it seems to have obviously kept this cult following going. And I think it's been really pleasing to see that there, there was clearly a lot of people waiting for this film to be rescued, as it were. Oh, absolutely. I, I got that question constantly. Just, you know, people would ask me, of course, a you know, facts about the Falk monster. And the next question was, when is somebody going to, you know, fix up the movie and re-release it properly? And so I I really thought it'd never happen until Pam kind of uh, got the ball rolling and saw the potential and was able to legally 
uh, get a hold of the rights, you know, uh, which was a long process unto itself. I mean, she's been working behind the scenes for years now, uh, kind of an uphill battle to get a hold of that film, get the rights, get get one that could be uh, transferred and cleaned up digitally, and and even getting the money because she self funded all this all along. And it trust me, it is not cheap to get to get a film remastered by the Eastman Kodak, you know, professional. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just, uh, uh, you know, something that this film has been severely lacking. And now finally, you know, people can see it in its proper glory. And in fact, I think the restored version in some ways exceeds probably what people saw in the movies originally. I mean, because now it's been, you know, digitally, uh, brightened and touched and, fixed up that they didn't have the technology to do that back then so it's like it's just night and day but I, the film and the cinematography is really comes forward and you see what a great film it is by being able to view this great version absolutely and i think some of these films really do deserve this kind of remastering uh, because it, it it really does I think it makes it almost like a different film, Lyle, because it just looks so clean and so crisp. I mean, I've only seen the trailer that's been remastered because obviously it's not been uh, released over here yet, the, the new version. But it just, it looks incredible compared, you know, I, I remember the, the original version and obviously seen a, fuzz, a fuzzier version over the years on video and stuff. So to see how it looks now, it's it, it's beautiful. It looks amazing. Yeah, it is. And there there's scenes in there that I... I saw that I never, I couldn't see before. There mm. was one particular section. It's, it's a little dark. I mean, it's a, it's a monster movie, so you have to. Some things are <laughs> shadowy, but when they've been dubbed several times from VHS and then released on a bootleg DVD, they, those scenes become pretty much totally black. And mm. there was one scene that I, I was like, I've never, I've never really seen this before because you couldn't see it on the dubs, and so this. You know, while it was still in the movie all along, it was almost like a, a lost uh, piece of footage because now I could see what was going on. And you you can see the quick view of the back of the creature and the hair up close. It was like, wow, this is cool. And that's the way you it should have been all along. Yeah, absolutely. So how's how's things in fault then? How have they have they because I know there's always been a it was one of those, I think. The, at the time they kind of put it to bed but i think it's once again over the years pe the people have been coming and i know when you first arrived has it have they kind of really fallen back in love with their monster over the years because i think when you first went there they didn't really celebrate this creature yeah i mean i've seen a slow steady increase in, in you know embracing this over time and i think right now it's more than ever uh the folks in the town you know really understand the significance of it and you know while just like any place some of them have an interest in it and some of them don't um overall you know i i when i go up there you know everybody wants to talk about it and mentions and if anybody's heard of a sighting they'll they'll tell me and uh, the the Monster Mart, which is a, basically a convenience store there um, that has, you know, souvenirs and stuff, um, we've been able to uh, slowly build up this small museum uh, in one of the rooms, in, in its back room, where people can see, you know, some of the historical items related to the legend of Boggy Creek. So, you know, we've slowly built that up and because so many people come there and even more so there's people coming there uh, just to see things. So, you know, you want to give them something. So I think the town has really embraced it and everybody's, you know, happy that we have a Falk Monster Festival now there uh, in the town, which last year, I mean, it was it was sold out. I mean, we couldn't even put all the people in the venue we had. So people come in there and want to go on tours and see all this stuff. And, you know, it's great, you know, tax revenue for the city while you're actually giving people something to see because people really want to come there and experience something. And it's fun to show them all the sites and tell them the history and things like that. So, uh, you know, it's it's wonderful to see all those things. 
Absolutely. And it, it's good to see as well, because, you know, as, we, as we've mentioned on, on Momo, obviously this is a town that has, has basically re-engaged with itself over this and, and seen the benefit that... Uh, would you say they were quite surprised to, to find out just how many people knew about the creature outside of the city limits? Or was it that kind of thing? Well, everybody went nuts in the early 70s and, and then it all kind of dis disappeared for 30 years. I think anybody in Falk who has traveled around has always been surprised um, at <laughs> the level of notoriety because I hear they'll tell me this all the time. You know, somebody's like, yeah, you know, I had I went you know, somewhere for work or what have you, you know, I was in, you know, New York or, you know, they could be in a restaurant or something. And they, they say when somehow people over here that they're from Falk, Arkansas, it never fails that somebody will come over there and say, well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is that, you know, do you, have you ever seen the creature, you know, that, <laughs> and they'll just be like, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I'm way across the States and suddenly somebody's, wanting to talk and so yeah they're constantly surprised at how well known this is and that's another reason why i think over time you know everybody there just says hey we're proud of our legend we you know you know whether whether we can prove it or not it's still significant cultural uh you know roadside attraction at the least that they can be proud of mm. so has has anybody continue to have any kind of experiences there Lyle or, or is it do you think it's one of those quite similar in regards to you know once again comparing it to Momo that it seemed to happen at a, a certain period of time and then not much has happened or have there because I'm, I'm sure that the, there's been sporadic reports ever since but probably not as as many at the same time that the original stories are based on. Right. Yeah, there's been a steady stream of them that have come out there, come out of there, you know, over the years. And I still get, you know, quite a few reports each year that I think are, you know, credible enough to, to you know, to log in on the sighting reports. Um, yeah, it certainly doesn't have the, you know, the pile on fury that it did in the 70s where it was just in the news every other day and that kept everybody kind of wanting to come forward telling their story but um even though it's you know every time i i go to falc i almost learn of a new sighting or some new bit of information that i didn't know before and so the most recent sighting uh was just a few months ago in which a, a woman saw something uh fitting the description of the falc monster cross a roadway so, you know, I'm constantly investigating these and whenever I can, you know, I go up there and kind of look into them. And that e e Boggy Creek being my sort of first and foremost thing that I research, you know, and, and, and close enough to where I can go up there and look into the sightings when they happen. So, yeah, it's a, it's a constant thing. And if, if people want to look at the sighting log, I have a Falk Monster website, which is Falk monster.net f-o-u-k-e monster.net and there's a sighting log on there and i'm constantly sort of passing that around when i see people on social media saying are there still sightings i'll just post that link and they go and look and say oh my gosh you know i didn't realize <laughs> that it had been seen that many times just since the 70s you know yeah i think that's you know as, as with anything lyle and that's a it, you know it's it's fabulous to see that people are still coming forwards and i think once again it's one of those things where no probably to your chagrin once the book came out somebody probably oh well i i saw it uh, about a week after all this happened no doubt <laughs> <laughs> oh oh yeah it was yeah one of the best sightings ever happened you know, like, you know right on the the heels of the book published and <laughs> You know, luckily in the case of Boggy Creek, see, I, I, I feel like it's okay because, you know, I did write the follow up, which was called Beyond Boggy Creek in Search of the Southern Sasquatch. And I, in that, I sort of explored the whole deep south of the U.S. Uh, in the history of sightings of similar creatures. And then I sort of added in some of those other, you know, sightings that I couldn't include in the first book, The Beast of Boggy Creek. And I plan to write a third one, 
so I can eventually put in all these other ones that have occurred. So luckily I have a, enough material in a place that I can put them. So it doesn't, doesn't freak me out too much when all these great sightings come in after the fact. <laughs> It's the cryptid that will not die, Lyle, I think. <laughs> no doubt. No, no, we know exactly what's going to happen when the book comes out, don't we? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's even more. So, you know, I, I could be writing – this could be my Harry Potter series or something. <laughs> I just continually put out Boggy Creek books, and hey, if so be it. I, I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's a wonderful, I mean, it's like I say, it's one of those uh, stories that stayed with me my entire life. So it's one of, one of the key – um, reasons for why I love this wonderful, weird subject of cryptozoology is down to Boggy Creek. So uh, we owe Charles Pierce a great deal of, of, of thanks, I think, for that. So, I mean, you've got, a, once again already, I know we're only just into 2020, but um, you've already got a couple of things coming up that are planned in. So delighted to see that you're going to be working again with Small Town Monsters on the final part of their uh, trilogy, uh, for the Mothman legacy. Right. Yeah, I'll be uh, narrating that one, um, you know, which goes hand in hand with our, our other, you know, the, the Mothman of Point Pleasant, which I originally narrated and, uh, you know, keeping in that uh, format. So I'm excited about that. Mothman is the other cryptid that never dies or it always, <laughs> fly, it always flies. Let's say that. <laughs> And so, you know, people are excited about uh, another installment, which we can sort of look at the bigger picture of of sightings, similar sightings and what's happened in recent years with with the Mothman case. So, yeah, that's that's a you know, that's an exciting one to uh, be a part of. Absolutely. Well, I was I was lucky enough. We had Tobias Wayland on, um, obviously, with his book. Um, regarding the the lake michigan michigan mothman because obviously at the moment the the it, it seems to be back in fashion but incredibly it seems to be more more well spotted and and more uh, certainly more reports about it in its modern version than there was back in in the 60s yeah i think so and you know perhaps that's because we have an easier way to share information now you know uh you know, even if the paper doesn't decide to write about it, somebody can, you know, submit it to one of these investigators and it can appear on blogs and and things very quickly. So the, this uh, dissemination of information uh, allows us to gather up sightings very quickly when there's a flap such as this where all of a sudden, you know, a, a Mothman-like creature appears in a particular area. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, uh, obviously, Seth touches, touched on the, the, the modern ones in uh, Terror from the Skies, because obviously that was dealing with, with wing cryptids. And, and whilst most people were perhaps suspecting it would just be about sort of giant eagles and, and you know, pterodactyl sightings to, to, to sort of just pigeon some of those reports together. But then the final part of the film is obviously focusing on what on earth is going on in Chicago. And it's it's quite interesting that it really does seem to have just picked up a whole new sort of wave of, of information and reports about the whole thing. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, that uh, that was one of the kind of hidden bonuses about Terror in the Skies, you know, and it was that the film, that documentary was surprisingly popular. And I think it's because we touched on, you know, not just the Thunderbirds and the Pterosaurs, but also the Chicago Mothman and the sort of tying these incidents together of people seeing strange things in the sky, obviously. And, um, you know, the the whole Mothman uh, type sightings in Chicago are, are pretty freaky because you're in a city. Now, now you're in a city environment. It's almost like this sort of Batman type creature, mm. you know, you know, flying above rooftops and and so forth and you know here we are in modern times and we're still getting flaps of strangeness in particular in certain places and the fact that it's in a big city is almost even more intriguing because you know you would think uh that that would be relegated to shadowy rural areas but this is the big city so it's it's been a fascinating case yeah, I think that's what makes it stand out at the moment, because like you say, 
city environments do not lend themselves to mysterious creatures, you're more likely to come across a, a haunting or, or, or poltergeist in, in, in urban environments. Certainly not winged creatures being spotted in the skies. Right, right. So, you know, that perhaps makes it stand out and, be, and somewhat unique. So it's gotten a lot of attention because of that. Mm. So in regards to you yourself uh, for a new book, I believe you've got a, a, a very different subject, something you've, you've not touched on before, which is going into the, the wonderfully spooky and dangerous world of mysterious and haunted swamps. Right. Yeah, I, de I decided, uh, you know, to, to kind of do something that's more geographically uh, based than what I've done previously is where it's, you know, revolved around a certain monster case. And this sort of had has become uh, has come out of the fact that a lot of the cases I've investigated have something to do with bayous or swamps. And I'm certainly living down here in Texas. I'm in the deep south where there are a lot of swamps and spooky environments. And it seems like I started looking and it just seemed like all the major swamps I could find always had a history of really strange and creepy stuff. And I, I love that whole, you know, the feel of the swamp, the environment and the creepiness of it. And so this also gave me the chance to examine other paranormal type occurrences in addition to the cryptids. I mean, obviously, you know, people see, you know, things like Bigfoot near swamps, but they're also seeing other phenomenon, ghosts, and there's stories of buried treasure and witches and all this other creepy stuff. So I thought, you know, this is this is a whole theme right here. So the, the book I've been working on kind of revolves around swamp, notorious swamps and whatever may lie within. Mm. I mean, it, they do tend to lend themselves more to, to mysterious stories and, and dangerous warnings, I think, because it, there's just something about them, especially if the mist just hanging above the, the ground a little bit. It just They just seem to be eerie places that attract weirdness. Oh, yeah. You know, and it, that's sort of the, the question that's proposed here is, you know, is is it, you know, are the things happening because the environment is conducive to that mm. or is are are these things happening there because, you know, that is a place where something, you know, could hide in relative obscurity, you know. Uh, so it's like it, are our imaginations running wild because it's a swamp, because it's, you know, this primordial creepy place or quite naturally, those are the most uninhabited places remaining uh, around the U.S. So, uh, you know, aside from large mountain tracks and, you know, that's that's a cool question to kind of weave in and out through there as we examine the tales. And I I've been to quite a few of these swamps so in the book as i've done in the past it's not just me sort of uh, regurgitating a, bu a bunch of facts and stuff i can actually uh, describe the you know the environment the feeling i got when i was at these places so i can bring the reader along much as i've done in these other cases um, to those environments as we sort of analyze all the high strangeness that has, uh, you know, bubbled out of these boggy environments. Yeah. I mean, it is it is quite interesting. And obviously, as you refer to, there's quite a lot of states have certain things. Is, has, has anything turned up that you were unaware of or perhaps didn't know as, as much about as perhaps you realized? Uh, you know, I'd, uh, what, what struck me in, in this research was how – one small area could have so much uh, phenomenon. You know, there could be a, a cryptid sighting, a spook light, ghosts, uh, you know, tales of a witch, um, and and even crazy stuff like uh, theories or facts, little facts about crashed planes, planes that had crashed in these swamps. And had disappeared. Nobody could find them because they were just sucked in by the mire. And I'm like, wow, that's nuts. You know, I could be canoeing in some swamp and literally going right over a, 
uh, you know, the remains of some aircraft that nobody had, uh, has ever found, things like that. And you, you realize how much could be hidden in there and just how much phenomenon is concentrated in one certain area once you sort of, you know, start back and examine old newspaper reports all the way up to what people are reporting today and you put that all – pack it all into one chapter, you go, oh my gosh, you know, this is – I just had no idea there was so much stuff that could go on in, in one particular area. Yeah. So has it has it kind of taken you out of the southern states? Have you gone all over the U.S. or have you basically stayed sort of left to right across the, the south of the country? Uh, the majority of them just the, that are the most notorious or that had the most phenomenon seem to be concentrated in the southeast ah. portions of the states. But I do cover – other ones, um, for example, Hockamock Swamp, which is associated <laughs> with the Bridgewater Triangle, and that's a, all the way up in Massachusetts, which mm. is the New England part of the U.S., so it's quite far away. And that's one that I that I have not been to, just uh, obviously hard to get, yes. you know, to get to them all, but um, – and, and there's others. I mean, there's ones from Michigan and, and other places, some of which I've been to and some of which – uh, I haven't, but the majority of the most notable ones, especially in the South, uh, I've at least uh, visited, if not actually canoed and camped or done some tromping about within. So, yeah. oh, fantastic! I mean, I, I was good. At, I'm glad you mentioned that because the, the Hockabock Swamp is, is obviously something I'm aware of because I've I've seen that brilliant documentary that's on Prime about the Bridgewater Triangle and it's. Uh, it, that's another area where you have got, as you refer to there, that seems to have everything going on in that area. The Bridgewater Triangle is, is one of those, as, as we label them, areas of high strangeness because it, it seems to have everything kicking off up there. Oh, yeah. And that, that's one where, you know, you, you couldn't you couldn't mention notorious swamps <laughs> yes. in the U.S. without having Hockamock because, you know, not only has the swamp got – uh, quite a few numbers of uh, phenomena going on just there. And I'm not talking cryptids, UFOs, ghosts, all kinds of stuff just in that. And if you branch, you know, zoom out to the whole Bridgewater Triangle zone, mm. the whole area is just something weird going on up there, you know, to have this much uh, strangeness. So, yeah, that's certainly one that I, you know, needed to cover and had to cover and was cool because it kind of gave me something to lead off that wasn't just in the south you know there there are swamps everywhere and and that's one if not one of the most notable of all the, of them all yeah certainly yes. is like i say it's it's one that's well known primarily because i think the 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 one creature that tends to stick out that that's alleged to knock about up there is obviously the pugwidge which is a which sounds a very strange creature yeah, this sort of, you know, short, creepy, I don't know how to even describe it. It's, it's just like a, a a really spooky hobbit type thing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's our version of the hobbit. I don't know, but it's it's cool, too, because it's you get to examine a variety of creatures and, and legends and tales all within the one area. And the Puckwudgie is one that extends back to Native American tales about this sort of a trickster type uh, creature that lived in the woods. And then you fast forward to modern times and you've got modern reports of people seeing something that fits pretty much fits within that description. And uh, yeah, definitely one that is fun to write about because it gives me an opportunity to cover something that Otherwise, there's not enough to it to make a book or anything. So mm. you, you, it's got to be covered within the context of either the swamp or the Bridgewater Triangle or what have you. So uh, I was excited to be able to write about puckwudgies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think looking at some of the footage I've seen up there, you're probably best off not visiting it because they tend to have a, uh, <laughs> As on that documentary, someone is allegedly possessed by one and goes a bit uh, it all gets a bit frantic to be honest so yeah I, I i think it's one of those places best viewed from a distance lyle uh possibly <laughs> so P people keep telling me the warning me against this sort of thing as i insist on delving into it and but you know i always say hey if i 
if I was possessed and survived, it would make a better story anyway. So <laughs> I got, uh, it's a win-win. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Putting, putting the art before everything else, my friend. So when's, when's the book due out? Have you got a, a potential date lined up as yet? I uh, don't have a solid date. I'm, I'm probably looking at, uh, at the earliest uh, summer this summer. So hopefully and that seems perfect for swampy for the swamp, a uh, hot, humid time of year. So I think summer is uh, when it will be released. But of course, people can uh, will be updated by me on social media and, and what have you as I as I know the schedule. Ah, fantastic! Well, I look forward to that as I do with all your books. And I think that's one of the things that sets your book uh, books apart, Lyle, is the fact that you actually do take the time to go and visit these places. You know, as you refer to when you first went to Folk and uh and and louisiana and and missouri to to you know get get a feel of the area which i think is what elevates your books because you know you're basically taking us on a trip around the town and you're taking us to the locations and speaking to people and and just giving us a a a bit more meat on the bones of the actual story and i think that always does your work um an extra bit of credit that it for me i think it just gives us a bit more that that perhaps we don't normally get in in certain books no oh, well thank you i i definitely try to go the extra mile and i i mean i always kind of when i started writing books i always tried to write something that i would want to read you know and and after reading quite a number of you know cryptozoology and other type similar books you know i thought you know it's it's one thing to just sort of delve out the sightings but it's another thing to sort of analyze the area and talk about the people and to go into these woods and so i always thought that that and it's obviously fun for me if i can possibly afford to do all those things somehow within the research i i jump at the chance so i think that's been a an exciting part about writing these things is it, it gets me out gets me have have a purpose to go somewhere and I have a purpose when I'm risking my life in the swamp <laughs> for <laughs> my re- for my readers. <laughs> yes, you've, you're probably very well, well aware how to fight off an alligator with a paddle, Lyle, I would suggest. <laughs> well, let's hope so. I almost, uh, I've been a few times that I've almost uh, came up on one where it could have been dangerous. So thus far I've survived. But, mm. uh, yeah, I'm always learning to be more careful and what to look for as I'm out there, I'm sure. Absolutely. I'm sure you've probably learned far more about snakes than you ever thought you'd know. <laughs> which yeah, just... which which are this to me, those are the most, you know, the, yeah. I'd almost rather see a, a Bigfoot or a ghost than <laughs> some of the pits of, of water moccasin cotton mouse that yeah. I've seen or ones hanging off trees glaring at me. I'm like, dude, I'd rather see a puck wedgie than that thing. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I've, I've seen notable pieces of footage uh i think one one particular clip was a chap who's fishing off a little pier and he's got this wonderful fish and then all of all of a sudden this cotton mouth just turns up so he ends up reeling them both and i was like right throw that back not going anywhere near that yeah no that's not a surprise i want to get at the end of the reel there Woo. yeah big time so obviously already this year i've, I've noticed your your um conference and festival itinerary is already uh filling up so have you found that this has continued to build as well lyle that you you now seem to be doing more and more of these because i think you've already are you already booked for for 10 this year i think you know uh yeah there's there's even more than yeah there's even more than that just as i sort of add them or confirm them so yeah at least 10 and there's yeah they just continue to grow there just seems to be uh you know from from the tried and true bigfoot festivals that you know occur each year they they get bigger and then there's others popping up that instantly draw a crowd to you know even just libraries and wherever i can go like for example in missouri uh, booking you know speaking presentations at libraries because people want to learn about local culture and uh, so yeah, it's just there's there's almost more event invitations that I get than I can even accept because there's only you know there's only so many weekends in a month, mm-hmm. and the t- travel and lo- logistics of it gets complicated. So but those are great things and it puts me out there meeting 
people in person, you know, fans of the books and oftentimes getting again, getting the way to go to an area, uh, making it economically feasible, because every time I do, someone will come in and say, you know, I had this encounter or, or did you know my grandfather saw Momo or, or whatever, and I'm constantly learning more. So it's much better than, you know, just simply sitting at home doing research. It's getting me out there and, and meeting people. Yeah. I mean, it must, I mean, to be fair, I think it's, it's one of those things that, you know, as, as, as a musician, you're, you're used to traveling, but I think it's, it's wonderful that, that you've now been able to sort of add to that this love of of the weird Lyle that's probably got you as you say you make that economic decision that's probably got you to places and met people and and got reports that you could never probably have imagined five ten years ago that you would even be in this position oh certainly yeah I would have, I, I you know when I first started writing the Beast of Boggy Creek I never even thought that there was such a thing where people would invite me places around the u.s and and want to hear the stories and certainly the you know touring in the band always had me in every big city you know mm. primarily and so i got to see uh the world that way and you know including you know london and other places uh but it was always the big cities with this i tend to find myself more in out of the way places or rural areas like you know, Louisiana, Missouri, or Falk, Arkansas, or Point Pleasant, West Virginia. So now I'm getting a tour of of small towns and the places where legends have come from. So this is a whole nother chapter to my uh, world exploration. Ah, fantastic. And, and touching on the band, so I think it was three years since the last album, was it Ghosts of the Southern Sun? Um, are you planning on taking ghoul town back out or I, I think you might are you planning to do some more recording uh yeah in fact um gosh three years yeah we've I've been <laughs> sorry <laughs> slowly uh, that's a good reminder of <laughs> get the flame under it but yeah we, i've actually written another album and we're in the process of learning those songs so we can record hopefully in march so it's one of those things I have to kind of juggle, but there's a lot of fans of the band, and it's something I like to do. I, I you know, if, if if writing books and cryptid stuff is my day job, then this is my night job, and I love both. So I try to balance balance that. So yeah, we we should have a new album out. Who knows? You know, maybe later this year. About as basically as fast as I can I can work on things, but um, you know, I'm sure the fans will be. Uh, glad that we're doing something on that the musical front as well brilliant well let's hope it brings you back to the uk as well because i think you played london last on the last tour did you yeah yeah we we came over there to play uh the ramblin man festival which mm. is the big, uh, big you know festival there and then we played london at the same time so usually that's kind of how it operates now it's hard to dedicate enough time to just do a you know go everywhere type tour so if we can get on with a big festival or play you know a concentrated area in a short period of time that's kind of how we do it and uh hopefully you know hopefully some other european stuff will come up we we get invitations but you know a lot of it uh just depends on my availability obviously absolutely absolutely well all power to you sir because i think most people would love to be able to say that you know their 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 love of of rock and roll and monsters is taking them around the world which yours certainly is and all power to you right yeah who could have ever thought this when i was a kid i'm going to be a monster hunting musician you know that, nobody nobody offered me that career path when i was at you know career day or whatever they wanted. <laughs> whatever it's scientist doctor i'm like ah yeah so somehow i've managed to eke that into into something uh that sustains me well enough so i'm i'm fortunate and thankful for that absolutely you still come to, contributing to room org you still working for those guys well actually i in last year i decided to um bow out of that i it is coming to the point where it was so much stuff and i was pulled in so many directions i thought you know i've just as much as i love everything i've got to uh, let let go some of it and that was sort of an obligation that didn't you know i wasn't uh, you know the, the the i wasn't the feature thing in the mag or anything and i thought you know they can they can probably possibly get by without me i don't know how but <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, I just had to bow out, which I regret, but I just couldn't do everything. So, um, you know, I'm I'm currently still a subscriber and a reader, but just not a contributor. Yeah, well, I think you know, with the greatest respect, Lyle, there's only so much, so, there's only so many plates, so many people can keep spinning, and I think that you know, it's credit to you. You probably realized that it you couldn't give it the time it deserved and therefore it, it's better to, to to quit while you're ahead than than have people question your commitment i suggest yeah exactly just you know and makes me feel less scattered in what i've got to do you know and concentrate on doing the best when i'm doing something a book or music you know i need to put as much as i can to into that to do the best work i can and if i'm pulled in too many places that just uh, becomes hard yeah absolutely so listen thank you so much for your time today as always it's always a pleasure um and thank you for coming back so firstly where can everybody keep up to date with your your work and follow you and find out where you'll be appearing this year well, uh, the best place would be to hit my website, Lyle Blackburn, L-Y-L-E Blackburn.com. And at Lyle Blackburn.com, you can find links to the band, uh, ghoultown.com or the, the aforementioned Falk Monster website, um, where you can kind of, uh, follow the other projects. But, uh, my books are available on, uh, the store, which is on my website. If you would like autographed copies or you can get them on Amazon as well and uh, uh, they are on the uh, Amazon UK site for my uh, UK followers and uh, you know, be sure to pick those up and to drop me a line if you've seen something weird or if you found my book to be interesting and I appreciate all the feedback and uh, yeah just and uh, yeah, obviously I've got uh, Facebook page and Instagram page and all those links you can get at, at lyleblackburn.com as well fantastic and like i said thank you once again for for coming back clearly it didn't terrify you too much a year ago lyle and uh uh i will hopefully uh get a hold of the copy of the next book when it comes out and have a look at that and hopefully we'll get a chance to speak to you again sometime absolutely i appreciate it you're you're quite knowledgeable and i enjoy being on the <laughs> show very much so uh yeah, i look forward to that uh, in the future well i'll take that as a as a massive that'll be my head swelled swelled for the rest of the day lyle so thank you very much sir <laughs> you're quite welcome well listen take care thank you again and all the very best thank you very